There we go. My name is Beth Foss, and I am the Director of Operations here at the Choroideremia Research Foundation. And today we have a really exciting guest presenter. Her name is Dr. You are Dr. Dr. Fei Jai. And I'm so sorry if I mispronounced that. You'll have to tell me if I did. Oh, good, good. All right. You're doing um, great. She comes yeah. to us from Canada and um, the University of Alberta. And she's going to be working with us or sharing with us today a little bit more about the importance of measuring outcomes when it comes to clinical trials. Um, and for those of us that have been following the clinical trials um, and that have been involved with research um, for the past amount of years that we've had at the CRF, we've had some challenges recently. And as I spoke with Dr. Fave prior to um, today, we talked about how we can still have a lot of hope and excitement and her work and her lab's work is going to come in real um, real handy or real, it's going to be a very important aspect of the work that we do moving forward. So this is part of the series we're doing about meeting our new researchers. Thank you so much for coming. And um, it is funded in part by our sponsors, and that would be Biogen, Santen, Genentech, and Spark Therapeutics. Um, as always, folks, we're going to be using the um, chat feature. So um, everybody's muted. And if you have a question, feel free to write it up and I will pose it to um, Dr. Jai. And I think that's it. All right. We're going to go ahead and get started. And Dr. Jai, you're muted. Just say, there we go. Just so yeah. you know, and uh, we'll go from here. Thank you again so much. Thank you for having me, Bess. Um, I'm really excited about uh, coming to this. Um, uh, you know what? We still can't hear you. Can you hear me now? No, we can't hear you. Hmm. Still, me? How about now? How about now? Oh, sorry. Right. Can you still hear me? Let's use the chat feature, guys. Let me take a quick look here. If everybody else can hear. All right. I'm going to fix it on my end. Go ahead. I see. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to share my screen. Can everybody see my screen? Okay, great. What a relief. <laughs> okay, so there we go. Oopsie. Okay, so thank you for having me. My name is Fei Jai. I'm a clinical research fellow at uh, University of Alberta. I was a trained ophthalmologist in China and I started to work on genetic eye diseases about 10 years ago. Um, so today I'm going to walk you through how I improve the outcome measurement from for crowderemia clinical trials with the support from crowderemia research foundation okay so just before i start just double check can can you still hear me and see everything okay you sure can we're good thank you okay thanks thank you for confirming so we'll just move forward so um most of you are very familiar with the disease crowderemia it's a rare inherited retinal diseases um, caused by loss of function mutations in CHM gene. So primarily it affects uh, three layers of the retina. Uh, they are photoreceptors, uh, retina pigment epithelia, which we refer as RPE, and the choroid. Uh, because most of the mutations uh, in CM CHM gene uh, cause the uh, cause a lack of uh, rat protein. So it has potential to be, treat, uh, to be treated by gene therapy trial. So that's why we, uh, in 2015, our center carried out a investigator sponsored gene therapy trial on six crowderemia patients. Uh, because crowderemia has been a lifelong expertise of our PI, Dr. Ian McDonough, um, so we obviously have accumulated a lot of knowledge before the trial. However, uh, when we started the trial, we still found that uh, it is totally a new uh, area for all of us. Uh, we 
encounter lots of challenges in this journey. And one of the challenge we um, encountered was uh, which is the most reliable endpoints. Well, um, just to show you what we uh, what tools we have in our toolbox, um, basically we have two gathered categories of um, endpoints. One is the function uh, examine a functional examination that uh, tests the retina function. So we have uh, best corrected visual acuity, also referred as BCVA. We have microparametry, we have parametry and electro, uh, electroretinography. So on the right side, we have some structural uh, endpoints we can use uh, to see the retina structure. Uh, so we have found this autofluorescence, we have optic coherence tomography and uh, found this photography. Um, it's a lot of terms, but I'll go over them one by one in my next few slides. So for um, best corrected visual acuity, uh, you guys must be very familiar with this um, um, test result. It's um, uh, for the clinical trials, we usually use a special chart uh, called ETDRS chart uh, to uh, for the patients, we ask the patients to read the letters and we record the numbers of letters a patient can read as um, his BCVA. So it is a very um, popular and, uh, and a widely used um, endpoints in most of current uh, trials. However, um, here's a picture from our um, two year results. Um, so in this picture, uh, we recorded the test retest variability in our six research patients. So in each um, figure, uh, red line represents the BCVA change um, in his treated eye and the black dotted line represents the BCVA change in the untreated eye. So for this patient number one, I want to highlight this patient. Um, if you look at his untreated eye, you can see several time points that he had um, significant uh, vis vis uh, improvement in his BCVA. Uh, of, of note, uh, FDA consider 15 letters of uh, BCV, um, ETDRS letter improvement as clinically uh, significant. Um, and as in this patient, he has multiple times in his untreated eye um, considered clinically significant. Um, and so we were able to monitor uh, patient number five longer enough up to 4.5 year, uh, years. And we also um, noticed one time 16 letters uh, improvement from his baseline in his untreated eye. So uh, we, we kept seeing this pattern in some of our advanced crowderemia patients, even uh, in our natural history study. So that's when we realized um, even in the advanced, um, crowder, uh, advanced crowderemia patients, um, their visual acuity has this um, fluctuation over the time. So simply looking at best corrected visual acuity may not be a very good approach for clinical trials like this. And I would like to mention another type of functional examination called a microparametry. So um, microparametry is also a, a widely used endpoints in uh, current clinical trials. So, here is a, here, here's an example from a, health, a healthy control. So basically this type of examination takes a, uh, takes a picture of the back of the eye, and then it tests the different location of the back of the eye to see how good this point can see, how good this um, part of the retina can uh, respond to the light uh, stimulus. So in this uh, healthy control, you can see all the dots are in green. That means um, these dots, uh, like the location, these dots uh, of the, these parts of the retina uh, are healthy. Um, it is able to, they are able to respond to a light stimulus. So the patient will be able to see the light stimulus and uh, press the response button and, and the machine can record this uh, response. Uh, response. 
So here we can see the average uh, retina sensitivity for this, pay, uh, for this healthy control is 28.6, uh, way above the threshold that is 24. Okay, so to compare with, um, I have two um, microparametry results from a same crowderemia patient. So you can see a lot of um, black dots outside his preserved retina. So these parts are the um, locations that um, retina fails, fails to respond to the, um, to the light stimulus. So the, the, the report will present as uh, less than zero. Um, however, if you look at the dots with colors, you can still see uh, a very different pattern between the result on the left one and the right one. So for example, for the dots, uh, which is zero um, here, it's 23 on the right side. So on, on average, um, the average um, retina sensitivity uh, is 10.4 on the left side and 13.8 uh, on the right side. So if you compare those two results, you may think, well, things, um, the retina has uh, like the preserved retina has very similar pattern. It's probably that this difference is probably because of the you know the progression of the disease. And, you know these two images may take several years apart, so you can see this difference. However, if I tell you that um, these two images were actually taken forty minutes apart, you might be quite surprised to see this test retest variability. Um, that is because for the crowderemia patients, um, advanced crowderemia patients, I, I would say, um, they have less stable um, fixation. So it is very hard for the machine to check their eye movement. So it has this test retest variability. And also, as we published in our previous um, um, manuscript, we found that uh, these location, these location, uh, these dots that located um, very close to the uh, boundary of the preserved uh, retina island, um, these dots has these dots has have very high test retest variability. So um, I'm not saying that these um, examinations are not important. They are still very important um, in our uh, practice, but. Um, all these findings, all these informations um, made us think um, if we should uh, value more of the structural uh, examinations uh, because we think um, structural examinations are more objective. So, so to move on, uh, we, I would like to uh, go over this retina structure with you again. So like I said in my, um, background slide. So primarily, we, we are interested in two layers of um, retina. So the first one will be retina pigment epithelial RPE. And uh, this, this, um, this type of cell is a monolayer cell that su uh, provides support to the retina um, health. Uh, and it is widely believed to be the primary uh, site that get damaged by crowderemia. And on the other hand, we also would like to uh, track um, the structure called a photoreceptor, which includes, uh, which includes uh, both cone and rods. So this type of cell is the cell that um, converts uh, light signal uh, into the biological signal and uh, um, uh, and from there, um, deliver uh, deliver the signal to the brain to uh, to um, to create this vision. Um, so we we would like to check those two um, structure uh, in our practice, and so so that's that's why we have our research question will be: Can we? Um, um, monitor and uh, measure these layers more precisely and efficiently uh, in our clinical trials so we can use them as, a, um, end, as end points. So in order to quantify retina pigment epithelia, I need to mention a type of uh, imaging uh, modality that is called fundus autofluorescence. It is a non-invasive retina imaging modality. So it, um, it uses 
a special light that can be absorbed and emit, emit back from the back of the eye. So uh, basically um, um, the, the fluorescing that can absorb, absorb and emit back is called lipophosing and it is very rich in the RPE cell. So when we take a picture, take a fundus autofluorescence, it is um, like a density of lipophosing to us. And here's a normal fundus autofluorescence. So you can see the these whitish, um, whitish uh, color, color, that is the um, autofluorescence from the retina pigment epithelia. And here we have a dark optic nerve and uh, dark um, in, in black vessels. Uh, these, uh, the, uh, just simply because this structure has no uh, retina pigment epithelia. Okay, so if we move to this picture, uh, here is a fundus autofluorescent image from a crotheremia patient. So we can see these black area that is lack of um, autofluorescent. So the, our goal is to measure, to quantify the preserved autofluorescence in crotheremia patients like this. So here are two images also from um, crowderemia patients. Uh, you, just looking at those pictures, you can see uh, how irregular it can be for their preserved autofluorescence. We tried to use um, the building uh, tour in Heidelberg I explored um, at the beginning, and we found it was really challenging and hard to use uh, uh, simply because the boundary is really irregular. So we, 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 were think, we were thinking if there's any better method for us to you know, mark the boundary and to get a more pre precise um, measure of the preserved autofluorescence. So I turned to Photoshop, a um, established um, imaging editing software. So I found the quick selection tool here. Quick selection tool is very powerful. It has the ability to um, detect to detect the difference in in in, in intensity bet uh, between pixels. So when I use this protocol, I established, and we I found it uh, it is much easier to mark the boundary of. Um, preserved autofluorescence. So we, we uh, my colleague, Dr. Manlong Xu and myself, we each measured 64 eyes um, at two time points, um, one year apart. And so that will be 128 pictures in total. Um, so let, let me show you an example that I um, measure, uh, that I uh, marked the preserved uh, autofluorescence uh, using Photoshop protocol. So these dotted line, white dotted line, uh, is the boundary uh, I, mar I marked with Photoshop. And if I zoom in to look closely at these three boxes, um, so on the uh, in the middle column, it's the um, boundary I marked with Photoshop. You can see it is much uh, better fitted uh, with the um, with the counter of the um, of the preserved islands. And so I also showed our uh, measurements from uh, using Hayex too as a comparison. So these white um, arrows indicate indicate the area that is supposed to be included in the measurement, but uh, incorrectly um, excluded from the measurement. And these blue arrows um, are the area that, that uh, are in, incorrectly included by the, uh, in the measurement. So using this method, we, um, both of us, my, uh, my colleague and I, uh, measured all the images. So from here, um, what I'm trying to show here is the integrator disagreement um, using different uh, type of measurements. Um, so the y-axis um, represents the difference between my measurements and Dr. Xu's measurement. So using HIX too, you can see our uh, disagreements range all the way from minus 12 to uh, 16. Uh, square millimeter in terms of FAF area. 
however, using um, using our um, new protocol, Photoshop protocol, our dis disagreement ranged from minus two all the way to uh, maybe four, but a much less intergreater disagreement. And we also tried to uh, compare the annual FAF decrease measurement uh, measured by uh, by by two graders using two types of um, protocol and we also found um, high x2 has much greater um, intergreater disagreement and uh, photoshop is is much better in this regard okay so here is our story uh, about the a retina pigment epithelium. So next I would like to move to another structure we also would like to uh, study, that is the photoreceptor. So which structure we would like to measure for crowdoremia? Uh, that is a stru structure called ellipsoid zoom. That is a special part of the photoreceptor that is densely packed with mitochondria. Because of this feature, um, this part can be visualized by optic, optical coherence tomography. So lots of patients must be very familiar with optic coherence tomography. Um, so basically it is a uh, imaging um, modality that's used a special light wave um, to uh, visualize the cross-sectional image of the eye. So we have different way to um, scan retina. So I would like to highlight three types of uh, um, scans. The first one will be single line scan here. So single line scan um, means we only scan the retina for once. And it, it is usually the um, cross the fovea, cross the center of the retina. So this type of scan takes a very short period of time. Um, but provide less, in, uh, less information. So usually we use it as a screening um, examination. Another type will be dense scan. So it consists uh, lots of horizontal um, skin um, and cover the whole macula. So that provides lots of information uh, for us. However, it requires more co cooperation from the patients. So um, during the scan, this may take two to three minutes. The patients need to have really good fixation. So there's another scan called the radio scan. Uh, it's somewhere in the middle. So it takes some time and provides some more information compared to single line scan. So, um, so these are three um, scans we usually use in our clinical practice. So um, here's an example how we um, use these different skins in our patients. So uh, in this four-year-old boy, uh, obviously we couldn't uh, expect him to look at the fixation target for two or three, two and two or three minutes without looking away. So we used a single one, sing, single uh, line skin across his fovea. Still, it's uh, good in, enough to uh, help us to. Um, notice he already had he ha already has some um, um, changes in his peripheral retina here and in his seven year old um, sister we use a dense volume skin dense volume skin which covers the whole macula okay so coming back to ellipsoid zoom so ellipsoid zoom is the second um, hyper-reflective band here in the um, OCT scan. Um, like I said before, uh, we use it as a, uh, as a indicator of the photoreceptor health. So in our original design for our um, crowdoremia gene therapy trial, we, um, we measured the ellipsoid, ellipsoid zoom lens, uh, i.e. EZ lens, um, lens from um, across the macula as an indicator for photoreceptor health. Um, 
as we want to have our measurement more uh, accurate, we wonder if it is possible for us to measure the area of a preserved ellipsoid zoom. And uh, um, from there, uh, we get dense scan on all of our available patients, chorderemia patients like this. And each well, uh, dense scan consists 97 horizontal scans. So my, my co-author, Sarah Oak, and I manually segmented the um, ellipsoid zoom component from each scan. Um, and uh, we reconstructed a unfars, uh, an unfars easy map um, using these um, slabs we segmented from each scan. So to compare with, we also measure the easy lens from different uh, angle. We measure the horizontal easy lens. We also measure the easy lens um, vertically and at 45 and 90 uh, degree. So we try to compare the area also with this um, different lens and to see uh, how how, how, much, how much information the easy lens can tell us. So here's our result. Um, with, the pro, uh, with the protocol I just mentioned before, we were able to um, create this unfars easy map here. So uh, my colleague and I um, separately measured the area from this easy, uh, easy map. We also uh, located the uh, center of the retina and uh, measure the easy lens uh, from four different direction. So in total, we um, segment and created um, first easy map for 20 eyes from 12 patients with um, confirmed the genetic diagnosis of crowderemia. We were able to uh, generate uh, the unfars easy map in all of them, although we found uh, this process is very time consuming, takes about, um, two, uh, takes about two days to finish one scan, to finish one easy map. Uh, we also, um, uh, we were also able to uh, successfully measure the lens. Um, so if we compare the uh, easy area measured by two graders, we found that uh, the mean difference was about 0.1 square millimeter, which is insignificant. So that means um, we have very good, we, have, we had an excellent agreement uh, in terms of the uh, easy area measurement. So um, by that, we, we, we are pretty confident that we can measure the easy um, area uh, precisely. However, uh, we're not sure about uh, effic uh, how efficient we can be. So, um, cause it is quite label demanding job. And uh, in order to provide an alternative, we, um, we uh, try to see if there's any cor correlation between the easy lens and the easy area. So we found that um, the endpoints we used to use um, to evaluate um, photoreceptor receptor, that is the horizontal um, easy lens across the macula, uh, it has moderate cor correlation with the easy area. So um, the correlation coefficient is 0.72, which is acceptable, but still moderate, because obviously you can see um, the preserved island usually has this irregular shape. So simply measure, measure the um, um, horizontal, uh, horizontal uh, lens is not enough. Um, however, when we take an average of the easy lens from four meridian, we found that um, the average easy lens has a really good correlation with the easy area. So um, um, the correlation coefficient um, increased up to 0.93, which is considered as highly correlated. So, um, so to summarize, um, we first identify some limitation of the functional examinations of retina in crowderemia patients. From there, uh, we try to quantify retina structure more precisely and efficiently. 
because we think it is more subjective, uh, objective, sorry. Um, so we established a Photoshop-based protocol, which allows which allow a more precise quantification of RPE cell. And we also explore, explore the method to quantify easy area using unfars easy map, which was feasible, although quite time consuming and label demanding. So as an alternative, uh, we suggest to, we can, we suggest um, some center if without uh, enough label, label, they can use the easy lens, um, average easy lens from four meridian as an alternative um, to quantify photoreceptor. So these two, uh, the results of these two studies were published uh, in Translational Vision Science uh, and Technology, a premium ophthalmology journal. Okay, uh, yeah, I would like to thank Crowderemia Research Foundation for their tremendous support uh, to my research. I cannot uh, achieve my research goal without their help. I also was, would like to say thank you to my department, uh, um, which has been really supportive as well. I would like to thank two co-authors, Dr. Malong Xu here. She is the co-author uh, for the uh, FAF project and uh, Sarah, uh, Sarah Oak. Uh, she is my primary co-author for the EZ project. And I also would like to thank my lab, lab members. Uh, They're all very uh, kind and compassionate. And uh, my uh, mentor, and supervisor Dr. Ian McDonough, uh, who guided me to this um, journey that is uh, full of joy and uh, uh, sense of fulfillment. And uh, lastly, I want to say thank you to my study patients for their time and devotion to the to research of crowderemia, uh, to crowderemia research. Yeah, thank you. And I'm happy to take any questions, uh, other questions. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, we, you. we absolutely love Dr. Mack. He is, um, he's the captain of the team. He's one of the doctors who have been with us the, the longest. So uh, he has a special place in our hearts too. This is all really super fascinating. And uh, thank you so much for presenting. We do have some questions and comments coming in. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is from, let's go scroll back up, Todd. Todd wants to know, or he just has a comment. It looks like HiX2, oops, everybody's writing, it's scooching me down. It looks like HiX2 is using a bad library for edge detection. As a geek, I am not at all surprised that the Ad Adobe cropping tool is better at edge detection. We should talk to Adobe and see if they can open source their algorithms um, for HiX to use. What do you think about that? Well, that's a very good comment. Actually, when I went through the reviewer process, um, the reviewer actually asked about, you know, what is, can you think about what is the algorithm uh, uh, for Photoshop? And I was, I, I tried to, you know, I tried to um, get to know their algorithm too, but I think that is considered as a commercial secret because secret, you know, uh, Photoshop has years of uh, history. So they um, established their uh, algorithm over the time. So we, I, I, I haven't tried to, you know, get, uh, get in touch with them to see if they're, you know, if they can share their algorithms for, um, for some software like Hex, like if there's any um, collaboration um, in the future possible. But I think that is very, very, very good point to man mention. I think their algorithm is their, um, like their strengths. So uh, like their strengths um, compared to these um, software we use for retina imaging. That'll be something perhaps we could follow up with you and others on that. He has a follow-up question here. Is anyone doing a longitudinal study following retinas across the disease lifespan? Um, that's a good question. So obviously other researchers are interested uh, in this topic. If we can follow a patient long enough, it will provide us a lot of uh, important information. Uh, 
I think there is some um, natural his history st study ongoing. Uh, we also um, we also we, we also have some of them, but um, talking about lifespan, it is really long commitment. So if we want to monitor those patients for this long, they may you know move from here to there, and it is really hard to check, check uh, to track them. So. I think what we can do is like using all the data available data points. Sometimes we can reconstruct, like construct a data set with you know all the um, data points and to to do some like like um, like uh, survival su survival analysis stuff like that. Uh, that is possible, but. Um, if possible, your recommendation is really good. Like we would be happy to do this type of study. Just uh, talking about the re reality, it is quite difficult to achieve. Yes. Thank you. Brent, uh, Brent says, fascinating work identifying details of the EZ. I'm sure it wasn't easy. Ha <laughs> ha, good job. Thank you. Uh, and then he asks, what's the age range of the 12 patients discussed during the latter half of your presentation? Um, I, if I remember correctly, I think they are most uh, middle-aged patients. Um, so that, that is also because we need the uh, preserved EZ to uh, fall within the scanning, a scan uh, window, like scan, um, scan, um, like the center macula. So I think their uh, age is about uh, 30 to say 50, like middle age, like the average will be something around 40. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, let's see. Kevin says, thank you for finding a better way to quantify results. Thank you, Kevin. Security, of course, has been something that has been a hot, hot discussion buzz point for us here internally. Kathy is asking, Kathy Wagner is our executive director. Um, have any of these been discussed with or presented to the FDA as a possible alternative to the traditional 15 letter improvement benchmark? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, well, I'm not in this circle because that's um, probably between the, um, you know, the industrial, our industrial partners and the FDA, but uh, based on um, what we have been doing, I mean, these trials, um, we know more, and I think uh, there will be more discussion between us and the authorities um, on this. Yeah, it is very important. Thank you, mm -hmm. Kathy. Uh, Brent, perhaps Adobe Photoshop will donate to the CRF to be a sponsor. Nudge, nudge. Well, I think uh, <laughs> Kathy watching, we can maybe do some work on that and approach them on this. Yeah, um, here's <laughs> another question. Another question. Um, using the Photoshop method, how can researchers use this uh, with gene therapy or stem cell research? Um, how can research use that? Well, uh, you mean you are talking about the access? Like, oh, do we have access to Photoshop? Like, obviously, I think they have, uh, Photoshop has um, a, like a research institute version, like we are allowed to use um, Photoshop for research purposes. Um, so if it comes to the commercial, like, um, like the industrial partners, uh, I'm student, I'm not, not too sure. Probably they have different pricing uh, roles, maybe. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm getting some messages off my phone. So just bear with me one second. Okay. And um, I think, I think those are all the ones that have come in. Let me just double check. If anybody else has any other questions, now's the time to send them in. Um, this is very promising. Can you talk a little bit to um, Dr. Jai about just the hope that, you know, one of the frustrations I think that we can share with our listeners and that, that the CRF knows is that when we have had some, um, gene therapy things go wrong, one of the benchmarks that the outcome that they always talk about would be the, um, those, the, the, the lines on the chart that had to be approved. Um, they had to improve on those lines. Can you give us any encouragement um, in terms of acuity benchmark, right? Um, 
Can you give us any ideas of how we could use this research or we could perhaps suggest this research or your documentation, um, your reports that you filed to help our, our, our organization continue with research and move forward? Sure, thank you. Talk that, about that. Yeah, um, I think um, with the results, um, like the results from these studies, um, we are more confident when we design a new clinical trial on crowdaremia. Uh, on crowdaremia. So uh, although we had some disappointment, like you said, in the past, um, past year, but still, uh, researchers are doing some new thing, developing some new things. So simply uh, use our lab as an example. Like, um, so we have been working on the uh, in inflammation, like how to, uh, to, to, we have been working to um, understand the inflammation triggered by uh, viral vector um, itself. So if we can suppress that inflammation, maybe, um, you know, lots of uh, current, um, uh, viral vectors can be useful in the future. And also we have other approach as alternative uh, treatment, like our lab, lab has been study uh, antisense oligonucleotide as a treatment that can be used for some patients carry special mutations. Like we, we can't treat all the crowdaremia patients, but some candidates from the crowdaremia pool may be suitable as a candidate. So for all these um, potential um, future uh, clinical trials, we can use what we learned from our research. Like, like we can design a more scientific, uh, more scientific um, clinical trial from the beginning. So we will not uh, miss anything while you know, carrying this kind of trial. So I think that is uh, the legacy from this type of research. Like we, are, we will be more confident in our future clinical trials, yes. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. One of the things that we like to ask our uh, researchers too is something kind of off the cuff. If there's anything um, fun that you wanna share with us from your personal life, anything that uh, would add some color to your research background? Well, um, maybe I can mention a little bit about my family. Uh, I was born in, a, in an academic family. My father is a meteorologist. So he supports my career a lot. And he kind of uh, urged me to, you know, go outside to communicate with people and, you know, to, you know, um, to develop something new for the all human beings. That's his big say. Yeah. And also my husband, he is kind of like um, middle school sweetheart. <laughs> like we knew each other since we were 13. And he is also a huge supporter of my career. Like he thinks what I'm doing is very important. And he always gives, always gives me encouragement. Yeah. So I think because I have this uh, supportive family and so I can enjoy what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> Which is wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time today. And uh, just again, thank you for everybody for coming today. And, and um, just as it is, it's providing our organization and our members just a, a great way to be able to learn more about our eyes, um, the disease process, what steps are being taken that, that the CRF is continuing um, full, full force ahead to find other alternatives um, to stop stop the progression and ultimately find a cure for choroideremia. So we uh, thank you so much for coming. Have a wonderful uh, autumn in 2022. And uh, again, everybody's just typing in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you. And for have a great having rest me. of your Tuesday. And I have to add the Crowderemia Research Foundation has been doing a wonderful job. I really enjoy my um, collaboration with them. So thank you for everything. Yeah. Oh, you're very welcome. And perhaps we'll see you at our next conference. Yeah. See you. All right. Thank you so much. Goodbye, everybody.